Shall we uh, get started? Mark, can you can the introduce Rio? Why not? No, there's, there's, there's this guy, Suzuki, Professor <laughs> Rio Suzuki, who's presently assistant professor in Calgary. Uh, he has the remarkable achievement of getting a tenure track job at the beginning of the pandemic when every job in the country was shut down. Rio was here in the computer science department working first with Tom Ye and then me and Daniel Leitinger. And he's responsible for some of the more uh, crazy, outlandish, amazing technological feats and hacks that we saw while he was here. He uh, also almost set the building on fire by melting our laser cutter, but we forgive him for that because of the excellent work that he's done since then. And today he'll be speaking on his vision of a programmable reality, uh, which I'm excited to hear how it's going. Cool. All right. Uh, shall, we, shall I begin? Yes. All right. So uh, thank you for the great introduction and then thank you for joining us today. So my name is Gyo Suzuki. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Calgary Department of Computer Science. So today I want to talk about uh, programmable reality uh, making the world a dynamic medium through visually and physically programmable environment. So uh, my main research area is in human computer interaction, uh, especially focusing on AR, VR, robotics, and the tangible user interfaces. And in, in this talk, I want to explain how we can leverage uh, these technologies to make the real world more dynamic and interactive for computation medium. <clears throat> so uh, let me start from my brief background. So I am originally from Japan and I, I moved to Colorado in 2016. And uh, as Max said, you know, I, I spent a uh, wonderful five years at University of Colorado and during my PhD, I also did an internship at Stanford, UC Berkeley, uh, University of Tokyo, Adobe, and Microsoft. And uh, in the year 2020, I graduated from University of Colorado and then the, uh, became a faculty assistant professor at the University of Calgary starting from January 2021. So um, that was my brief you know, background. So let me start from the, my research vision. So my research vision is the changing the world itself, a dynamic medium. So let me explain what it means. <clears throat> so the term the dynamic media is coined by Alan Kay in 1960s to 1970s through uh, two very popular and very you know their influential papers one of which is a personal computer for children of all ages and another one is a personal dynamic media and through these two papers he almost defined and shaped uh, today's computing technologies including a uh, personal computer or tablet or graphical user interfaces and uh, object-oriented programming. But more importantly, um, I think that he was the first person who see a computer as a medium. So in this article, uh, he's saying a computer is not a merely a tool or a device, but the computer can become a dynamic medium for thinking, expressing, and programming through dynamic representations. So let me just explain what is the dynamic media and what is a dynamic representation is. So by using a computer, we usually uh, use the medium such as uh, drawing a rectangle or drawing a line, you know, but these are essentially a uh, static representation, right? So which is basically the same as what we do with the pen and the paper. So it's actually on the dynamic medium that it's a static representation. But what I mean by dynamic representation is by 
leveraging the power of computation, you know, we can simulate or we can animate or we can make things interactive, uh, which is actually, you know, gives us a powerful way of seeing, uh, thinking and the designing, uh, which we cannot do with a pen and a paper. So that's why I am very excited about kind of his vision of the next dynamic media. So uh, as you can see, a dynamic media and the dynamic representation uh, give us a powerful way of thinking, understanding, and creating and communicating ideas, right? So I, I personally think this is a very, uh, you know, one of the biggest invention ever the human history because the human cannot have uh, the medium for thinking that we cannot think before. But today, one of the problem I see is uh, di this dynamic media has been trapped as the pictures and the glass for, you know, since 1960 to almost like uh, for 50 years. So what I mean by the pictures and the glass is what we can program is basically a virtual object on computer screen, which we cannot touch, manipulate, or grasp, or interact with in the same way we do with the real object uh, in the real world. So I am, uh, I, I wanna change this situation, this paradigm. So my vision is the changing the entire world, you know, entire world into a dynamic medium so that now we can what we can program is more like an entire living space rather than the virtual object on a tiny rectangle. But also in you know, the dynamic medium can be something where the people can work together with the real objects in, in the real world as if we are living in a computer rather than living with a computer. So that is uh, how I as the future of the computers and, uh, and the future of the computation medium, which really excites me um, for, for the research. So towards that goal, I have been working on two approaches, two, two directions. So one of which is the leveraging a dynamic visual representation or the, for, for the immersive media, which is often called or often leveraging mixed reality technologies. But not only for this, because we are a physical animal uh, surrounded by physical object and environment, but this physical, you know, representation of static. So I am interested in how we can also make this physical object or representation dynamic, uh, which I call reconfigurable reality. So by leveraging both visually and physically programmable environment and reality, I am trying to make the entire living space as a program of reality for dynamic uh, medium in the future. So let me quickly um, go explain about what I have been trying to do with mixed reality. So the goal here is I wanna make the entire world a dynamic and interactive canvas. So rather than confining ourselves into a tiny rectangle screen, we can now take a sketch and interact with real objects in the real world. So that is my, my goal in, in, in this slide. So uh, the first project that I wanna share is the reality sketch, dynamic sketching in AR, uh, which is published at uh, UISD with 2020 uh, with the collaboration with Adobe Research, uh, which also won the honorable best uh, honorable mention best page. So instead of showing the, the the video, let me just quickly go to uh, let me quickly go uh, play with uh, an, uh, the real time demo. <clears throat> so as you can see, the reality sketch is the uh, kind of augmented reality sketching tool. So you can like a uh, sketch uh, like this through a line. But unlike the existing AR sketching tool, whatever you draw and whatever you sketch, it can be actually you know dynamic, dynamically moved down to the physical art. So for example, like if you draw a line like this, and if you draw a line like this, 
and that everything can be you know, dynamic and parameterized. So by using this parameter, we can also make uh, the, the real world a little bit more dynamic and interactive, such as if I bind this uh, parameter as uh, like a size of the dynamical model, then that we can actually kind of make it a little bit more interactive. And if I say this angle should be uh, like a bind to the angle of this dynamo model, then we can, you know, like a rotate it like this. And again, you know, everything is a dynamic parameter. So we can also kind of say like a visualize this uh, parameter such as like a, this should be like an angle like this and that we can actually visualize this motion in real time. So again, everything is a dynamic sketching, so you don't really need any of the programming. So that is a, a quick demo of the dynamic, uh, sorry, reality sketch. <clears throat> so as you see, uh, the reality sketch aims to blend the virtual and the physical world through making a sketches uh, interactive and responsive. So um, by leveraging uh, object uh, computer vision and object tracking, what you can see is basically, you know, the, uh, what you draw can be dynamic. And we have also explored a range of application scenarios such as we can make um, kind of augmenting, we can make, uh, we can augment a physics experiment for the classroom, or we can also augment the concept explanation for like a mathematic classes, classes. Or we could even analyze and visualize like a sports training such as a yoga instruction or like a basketball training, or even we can make, we can use like everyday objects as a tangible user interfaces without any programming, but you can quickly kind of sketch and define this, you know, the, uh, make, make this everyday object uh, more like time to be used interfaces. So through this project, I am envisioning to make the world itself as a dynamic canvas where we can interact with the real physical object in the real world. So that, is, that I mean by uh, the dynamic canvas and the dynamic video representation. But again, this is not the end of the story because I am also interested in how we can make a physical representation for the dynamic medium. So this is a um, uh, little bit, you know, the, uh, 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 the tricky because no one really knows what kind of the system or medium would look like. So during my PhD, I have been also trying to explore uh, a lot of exploration through this kind of concept video. So that is a concept video that I uh, took during my PhD, but imagining what if a physical object can be dynamically rendered for the changes like a pixel on a computer screen. So through these kind of hypothetical materials or hypothetical medium, uh, we can also make the work itself as the dynamic physical medium. So that is a kind of second line of my exploration. Uh, in my in my career, so the goal for the the second line is I am also interested in making the world a dynamic physical medium, so that you know the the physical object and physical environment can also represent information, but also dynamically animate simulate. So this is not a VR, but this is not also not an AR, but it's just R, you know, VR physical model that you can touch. So to align this product, uh, I want to share one of the projects uh, I have been working on, which is the Dynabrock, Dynamic 3D Printing, uh, which we published at WIS 2018. So with the Dynabrock project, we basically try to explore what if a 3D printer can become a dynamic physical medium by rendering a shape in seconds, not in hours. So 
you can what you can see here in the video is the actual real time, and then the Dynabo can construct and assemble this 3D arbitrary 3D shape in seconds, you know, not in hours like a 3D printer, right? So with that kind of capability, we are interested in interested in what if you know this 3D printer can become a dynamic physical, you know display of dynamic physical rendering so that we can do uh, we, we can interact and explore through our physical hand and in a tangible manner. So this is a, one of the examples we are trying to explore is what if the CAD modeling is not a manipulating a virtual object on the screen, but tangibly manipulating the like Lego block or clay, but in a dynamic manner. So that is the dyna block. So I'm not gonna go into the detail of the technical stuff uh, due to the time, but the DynaBlock basically dynamically assembled uh, 3,000 of magnetic blocks. And, and on this table, we have a bunch of like 16 by 24 actuated pins that can push the blocks on top of it. And then yeah, by computationally kind of pushing this uh, this pin and these blocks, we can create layer by layer. So it's exactly the same as how a 3D printer create arbitrary 3D shape. So with that, we can actually create any arbitrary 3D shape with that. So by by using this kind of computational, you know, uh, assembly, uh, we can create um, this this shape in seconds, not in hours. So Dynabrook is still like a one centimeter resolution for the block, but we are also envisioning if we can make it smaller and smaller, then we can achieve something like this, which is called Claytronics vision. So the Claytronics is the programmable material that can change the, like a color or materiality, or that can also change the shape in dynamic and a programmable way so that we can use this physical matter as if, you know, this is a kind of shape changing display, right? And we can also use it as a physical media. So the Dynablock obviously is a stepping stone or like a just first step towards that vision. So another project that I want to share is the ShapeBot, um, which is uh, we try to explore a little bit different approaches where what if we can use this a swarm of robots to represent the information or uh, use it as a medium for expression? So the shapebot is a demonstration of swarm robots that can both individually and collectively transform their shape. So we explore how shape changing swarm robots can expand a range of the expression for information display, but as well as like applications for tangible user interfaces. So as you can see, like a shape bot can display a lot of different information such as shape or text, or even like a uh, leveraging a shape changing capability, we can also visualize information or visualize data, such as like a showing like a sine wave, or uh, we can also physicalize data. Say, for example, this is uh, population data for, for each state of the United States. And it can also clean up for everyday, you know, clean up the table for everyday scenarios. So with the shape bot, you know, we can make the digital data into the physical one in a dynamic way. So this is the, uh, one of the application where the user is manipulating CAD model and then these robots can assist how you design in a physical manner. And one of the interesting, you know, aspects of the shape bot is it can distribute it into the environment, so they can become a tool whenever they, whenever you need. And then the, uh, it can go away when you you don't need it anymore. <clears throat> So this is one of my favorite applications, but it, this robot can also provide physical, dynamic physical affordances when if the coffee cup is too hot to drink or touch, then that this robot can create like a vertical plan. And then once the, you know, it's the, the coffee cup is ready to drink, 
they gonna go, you know, disappear and then indicate, you know, that you can now uh, ready to drink or ready to touch. So which is the kind of shape bot we were interested in kind of exploring how these one robots can uh, provide everyday assistance that also uses as a medium for expression. <clears throat> so in the in the previous two projects, uh, focusing more on the rigid materials, but I am also very interested in how we can also leverage like a soft material. So this one more here is we have been uh, exploring entirely soft shape changing module for dynamic sigma medium. So the more here is the basically uh, modular soft robots that can be programmed with your hands. So whenever you deform these robots, then the, these robots can have the recognize a record your behavior, and then it can actuate in the same way you do the demonstration. <clears throat> so the technology behind it is uh, we actually invented entirely soft deformation sensor with conductive sponge. Uh, so this is also one of the technical contributions we did, but by measuring the electric current between a top and bottom, we can assess the deformation and the using pneumatic actuation, uh, we can kind of transport this uh, deformation into the another module. <clears throat> so by using that, we have demonstrated a lot of different applications. So one of the interesting ones is we can actuate the existing uh, soft material such as stuffed animal. So that you can attach this module into the stuffed animal and then they, you can actuate and program, uh, you know, just like uh, without any programming on a computer screen. <clears throat> so these lines, of the work is we are envisioning the kind of future of the clay. So the future of clay is no longer kind of static material, but it's actually dynamic material and the dynamic interactive material. We can also, this clay can also kind of interact with the user input. Also we can like manipulate and program in the same way we do with the clay, but this is a, like a dynamic physical medium. <clears throat> and maybe some of you may have noticed that uh, all of my products, you know, share one common thing, which is leveraging the collective modular elements. Uh, and that is uh, one of my PhD dissertation contribution and a topic. So in my PhD dissertation, I have defined a collective shaping UI, which is a new class of the shape changing UI that leverages the collective individual element. Because the collective shape changing UI has the, a, lot of over, uh, a lot of advantages over the existing shape changing user interfaces or shape changing display in terms of the general purposeness as well as the deployability. And <clears throat> in my thesis, you know, I have explore uh, uh, the different design space of the collective, collective shape changing UI and created a taxonomy of this kind of shape changing, collective shape changing user interfaces. And I have also demonstrated through the different geometry, different design space through uh, these you know, different uh, projects. So that was the, uh, my overall summary of my PhD work, where I have been focusing on leveraging a dynamic, you know, visually programmable environment and a physically programmable environment, which I call the computable reality, to make the entire world a dynamic media. So, in the remaining time, you know, maybe some of you may already have no, you know, no bunch of the work. So uh, I, let me try to uh, showcase, quickly showcase what I have been working on after my graduation at University of Calgary, starting from January, 2021. So it's more like a one year ago. <clears throat> so if I summarize 
uh, my, my previous work, which can be situated between these two spectrum. So one is uh, mixed reality side, and uh, another one is a reconfigurable reality. And as you can see, my work can be categorized into the three domains. And let me just explain one by one uh, what I have been working on. So the first one is uh, trying to create a novel interaction for AR or mixed reality to for, for dynamic visual representation for the dynamic medium. So one of the, uh, the projects we have been working on at the University of Calgary is we are interested in create dynamic medium for communication by augmenting spoken languages. So <clears throat> spoken languages, you know, that we, the humans have been using spoken languages over like a thousand or even tens of thousands of years. But it hasn't been, it hasn't been changed for, uh, for over a thousand years. So we are interested in what if we can leverage this kind of mixed reality or dynamic medium to augment this communication. So we are focusing on two modes of communication. One is the person to people uh, presentation. Another one is the person to person uh, conversation. So let me first uh, talk about uh, augmented presentation first. <clears throat> so what I mean by the augmented presentation is something like this. So this is a, a kind of random video that I can find from the YouTube. But as you can see, this kind of augmenting the live performances, the storytelling or presentation actually gives you a more, how to say, engaging uh, experiences uh, for the storytelling, right? So this is a very exciting. But one of the problem is this, to create this kind of the video, you know, you need, a, you need to have a lot of time and effort for video editing or the programming because all of the video are actually made by, you know, hundreds of hours for the video editing uh, with the professional. So we are interested in uh, what if we can actually create this kind of augmented presentation in real time without any video editing or the programming for live storytelling. So that is uh, the quick uh, demo. So let me uh, show you the demo. Hi. My name is Mehrat. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Calgary. Today, I want to talk about augmented presentation. As you can see, when I talk about something, we can augment the presentation using an augmented reality interface. We have several features. We have, for example, live kinetic typography, embedded icons, embedded visuals, and embedded annotations to physical objects. All components are interactive with gestural interactions. And most importantly, all animations happen in real time. This means that no video editing or programming is required. This enables more expressive and engaging real-time pre real live presentations for many applications. In this talk, I want to describe the design and implementation of our system. So you, maybe you can probably get the idea, but using natural language processing and a keyword extraction and also augmenting embedded visual, we can actually create this kind of engaging live presentation in real time without any preparation or the programming. And I, I know, you know, the, uh, one of the another students is working on and it's also still very demo is a preliminary, but I, I think they, I hope you can get the idea of what we are trying to do. And to design this kind of system, we have analyzed like 300 of the videos from existing video edited augmented presentation available on YouTube. And then that we have identified the common interaction patterns or interaction design space for real time augmentation, augmented presentation. So we are, we are trying to kind of implement all of these feature for the presentation and then we are, we are trying to deploy um, that is our current goal. So that was the augmented presentation. But again, we have 
also kind of different modes of communication, which is the conversation. And we are also interested in augmenting conversation with on the fly differencing in AR. So, which means that, you know, yeah, whenever we have a conversation, you know, if you don't have any unknown information, you need to know like what it means. But in the common technologies, you know, we need to grab the smartphone, which actually like distracts the conversation or eye contact or social interaction. So we are interested in what if we can use like AR or mixed reality technology to uh, engage and more create more engaging natural interaction. So here's the another kind of quick demo that I want to share. Hey, it's been so long. I heard you were backpacking in the Alps. How was it? It was great. Um, I had a really good time. We actually took a lot of pictures. You can see them on my gallery. Well, I went to Mexico with my family, saw one of the seven wonders of the world. Cheats and it's a... Ah, okay. A uh, pre-Columbian city built by the Maya people. Super interesting. If you ever go there, do visit the Warrior's Temple. Oh, the Warrior's Temple. Oh, wow, I see it's right next to the Chichen Itza. Yeah, I really should. Next time I go to Mexico, I'll do that. Also, Calgary's getting pretty cold now for the next week. Oh, minus two. That's so much colder than Mexico City. I wish I was back there again. Well, I'll catch you next Monday. Don't forget about our management meeting. See ya. See ya. Yeah, so again, you, you can probably get the idea, but we can uh, extract the keywords from the conversation, and then the, we can show some visual references or like a photos or weather or on a map in, in real time on, on the fly so that it can support your conversation through these kind of dynamic medium. Uh, so with this kind of technologies, we are envisioning to enhance the existing presentation or discussion and the brainstorming. But uh, we are also interested in kind of uh, applying for the accessibility purposes for deaf or hard of hearing people. But also we are somehow very interested in to enhance the interaction between, uh, interaction with uh, the smart speaker like a Google Home or Alexa. Well, so again, this is a master's and undergrad student working on, and the demo is still very preliminary, but you know, it's, it's still an ongoing project. And we are also getting some funding from Adobe and SNAP for collaborative research for that. <clears throat> so that was the I know, yeah, how, how we are trying to uh, use the AR or mixed reality for augmenting the language or augmenting communication through dynamic video representation. So that was the uh, mixed reality side. And I also want to share what I have been working on in uh, reconfigurable reality, because one of the challenges for reconfigurable reality is, you know, the kind of manufacturing and miniaturizing this module is a very, uh, very uh, challenging you know, because these, creating these robots can actually take a lot of time and effort. So how we can actually scale this manufacturing with somehow very important business topic. And with the collaboration with MIT, we are creating a therapy configurable modular robot with no moving parts. So it's essentially, we are trying to leverage electromagnets uh, and the power and magnets to actuate these passive objects. Um, um, but also by attaching this electromagnetic module into the cube, we can also reconfigure by themselves by attracting and repelling you know, forces between it. And the most importantly, there's no, no moving parts. So we can actually fabricate, assemble, and uh, you know manufacture with the standard manufacturing technique without any you know the human involvement. And it's also very cheap, actually. It's very inexpensive because it's essentially just a coil, you know. So we can actually you know uh, create a lot of this. And 
even like a crazy thing is uh, one of the students actually experimented in a zero gravity environment. So we have confirmed this module can reconfigure themselves them, themselves in, in the space, which could be somehow very interesting application space, application domain for, for the future. And by using this module and the reconfigure themselves, we can create one shape to another. So we have uh, submitted and published, you know, accepted at the ICRA, you know, uh, which is one of the top conferences in the robotics uh, conference. So you can probably see here's a ICRA logo uh, for that. Yeah. So that was uh, what I have been working on in uh, reconfigurable reality. But I am very interested interested in intersection between the middle. So how we, how can we combine mixed reality and reconfigurable reality? And one of the domain for that is the robotics for AR VR, like robotics for uh, mixed reality, because the one of the problem of the AR VR is when whatever you see is just a virtual object. So there is no tactile or haptic sensation. So whenever you try to touch, you know, the illusion disappears. So we are interested in what if these reconfigurable robots can create touch or haptic sensation on demand, which is a we published at WIS 2021, haptic bots using a swarm robotic haptics for virtual reality. <clears throat> So a haptic, haptic bot is a swarm of the robots that can provide a haptic sensation for VR. So whenever you try to touch in a VR environment, these robots can create like a surfaces so that whenever you try to touch, you can actually feel the tactile sensation for that. Uh, so this can be used for entertainment or medical uh, experiment or like a training purposes for flight simulation. <clears throat> so these robots are leveraging the tape measure, which is uh, kind of robust and enough for haptic purposes, haptic sensation purposes. And by using these robots, we can also demonstrate a lot of different interesting haptic interaction, such as like a showing, uh, such as you know, just uh, creating surfaces or even uh, allowing the user for the graphical or haptic interaction or the tilting surfaces. And more uniquely, I think that these robots can also render uh, continuous surfaces uh, for the VR by leveraging a locomotion and a shape changing capability, which is somehow very unique for haptic bots. So that was uh, robotics for AR, VR, but I am also very interested in opposite direction, which is AR, VR for robotics, like how we can leverage like a mixed reality technology to enhance the human robot interaction or enhance the reconfigurable reality. <clears throat> so one of the contribution I did after the graduation is we have uh, written augmented reality and robotics, a survey and taxonomy for AR enhanced human robot interaction and robotic interfaces, which is published at CHI 2022. And with this uh, paper, we have surveyed and analyzed uh, the taxonomy of the existing AR and robotics research. And we have, you know, uh, explored the different approaches, different design, and different purposes uh, to create, you know, to, to organize existing AR and robotics taxonomy paper. <clears throat> and another contribution we did is also created an interactive gallery with the website, which uh, where we have collected all of the existing AR and the robotics paper. So you can actually, this would be a very helpful resources for like a student or researcher who wants to start working on this domain. So if you go to this uh, website, I love the ca 
AR and robotics, you can actually see this kind of uh, website on, in live. And another contribution we did through this paper is we also have identified eight different themes for the future research opportunity in AR and robotics. So let me pick up just only four um, in this talk. So the first direction I am really uh, very exciting is that AR using uh, real-time embedded data visualization for augmented reality and human robot interaction for better decision making. And by showing what the robot is trying to do or what the robot is thinking in the real world using an AR, we can create like a explainable AI or explainable, explainable robotics in the real world in a more explorable manner. So I am very interested in these two domain, which I think is very promising and even fundable. So I am aiming to kind of write a little bit large ground with this uh, topic. Another interesting area is uh, designing and exploring new augmented reality and human robot interaction, such as you know we can now be imagining we can start reimagining the robot design uh, because we can actually show whatever we want in a mixed reality. And we can even further blend the virtual and the physical world. So for example, this one is the you know, virtual force that collapses the boxes, which never happens in the actual world, but combining actuation with the virtual object, we can actually create this kind of illusion, which might be very interesting for entertainment or remote collaboration or education in the future which we are actually working on right now. <clears throat> so that was the intersection between the mixed reality and the reconfigurable reality. And as I said, I am very interested in the robotics for AR, VR, and AR, VR for robotics as well. So let me conclude. <clears throat> so as I said, I am very interested in my research vision is the changing the entire living world into a dynamic medium so that what we can program the entire living space and the dynamic medium can be something where uh, people can work together with their objects in the real world as if we were living in a computer rather than living with it. <clears throat> and towards that goal, I have been working on a two different approaches. One is the mixed reality, another one is the reconfigurable reality. And I think that both aspects, visual and physical, are important. And then the, uh, by, by calling it the both visual and physical programmable reality, I am calling umbrella term as uh, a programmable reality. And if I situate my work, and then the, I can categorize these three domains. The first one is novel interaction or AR. Another one is a collective change UI, and the, the, the third one is the intersection in the middle. But all of the projects are going towards my vision for the dynamic visual and the physical medium for the entire world. So let me just uh, uh, conclude with this slide. So today, you know, today's generation of the children is often called digital native, who can take you know, touch screens for granted, right? So which is essentially the same as what the Alan and Vision over the 50 years ago. But in the next 20 to 30 years, I am envisioning the children of the next generation who can be called immersion native, who can take the worst canvas for granted. So I am very excited and passionate about to create the media uh, languages or interaction for the children of the next generation who can take this kind of work canvas for granted to think, collaborate, or communicate uh, the idea between them. But this is not the end of the story. And even after that, I am also envisioning programmable natives who can take dynamic physical media for granted. So this is a you know kind of science fiction like a near Stevenson's Diamond Age. But I am really 
excited about the future of the children and can actually use this kind of dynamic media, dynamic digital media for the thinking and communicating ideas. And of course, this is a kind of long, long-term research goal as the mixed reality actually started in 1968. And it took about like a 50 years until the recent height of the metaverse or omniverse or whatever thing, right? And of course, I am very, you know, you know, excited about the potential for the mixed reality for dynamic dynamic digital representation. So I am also trying to push the boundary of this. But in the same way, I am also interested in the computer reality. As I said, you know, this is a long-term goal because it started about 2010 and it's still kind of long goal ahead of us, right? But, you know, in the future, I am very interested to create this, you know, this kind of dynamic physical medium actually happens. Uh, and then the children of the next generation can take this dynamic physical medium grounded for the medium of thinking just like what we do with the iPad right now, similar to the what the RNK and vision. So that was my vision, and that's exactly what I'm trying to do for over the next decades throughout my career. All right, with that, I want to thank all of my masters and undergrad students at the University of Calgary, and. I also want to thank all of my advisors, the thesis committee, and the collaborators, which I, I couldn't put all of them in, into the one slide, but I really appreciate this kind of awesome uh, collaboration. And I also want to thank the research institution and the sponsor who can support my, uh, my work. <clears throat> all right, with that, uh, I, I want to conclude my talk, Programmable Reality, uh, Making the World a Dynamic Medium through visually and physically programmable environment. And my name is Bill Suzuki, and I am really grateful and thankful to have an opportunity to revisit in the Colorado again. And I'm also happy to take any questions. Thanks. <clears throat> I don't everybody talk at once. Everybody talk at once. I think JP has his hands up. Yeah, I, um, oh, Jessica, you want to go? I can wait. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I really, <laughs> I love the, the presentation. Thank you very much, Rio. Um, actually, um, I love the bear. I want the bear. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, and the, 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 the drawings were fantastic too that you did that, or, or whoever did them and they're fantastic. The, the thing that intrigued me, many things intrigued me, but my first question really is, um, you, know, you, talked, uh, you, know, you talked about ghost effects on one of the slides and you had one of the little drawings was a fairy and that's the one where you know, it looked like somebody was shooting an energy ray at a pile of blocks. So you had superpowers. Oh, so this one? <laughs> oh, this one? Oh, this one? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, that's the, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So right. let, let me just, uh, yeah, since we have been also working on in this domain, so let me just show you some of the examples. So, let's see. Um, so maybe you can probably see the slide. But yep. imagine like uh, the physical object can be actuated with the virtual force or virtual constraint. So think about this. White one is the uh, virtual sketches, right? And uh, the this kind of white dot is a physical object. And obviously, physical objects never affect. Uh, sorry, virtual objects never affect the physical world, right? Because even like a virtual object or virtual human, push, for example, if I am a virtual virtual human, and even I I push the virtual physical object, it doesn't move. But if we can kind of seamlessly coupling actuation and the virtual, you know, virtual mixed reality, we can provide some illusion for to actuate, 
to 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 simulate the virtual object can actually affect some physical work. So this is what I mean by existing AR is we can always like push the virtual object, but we are kind of thinking about like an opposite direction. And then say for example, like a, this is a um uh like a well this may yeah again this is still a very ongoing project so it's very preliminary but like a, this physical object can represent virtual information but also um uh, yeah this may not be a best example but by by combining like by in integrating the virtual environment and the physical world we can start uh creating some more interesting interaction which have haven't been explored yet so that, I mean, that that that's, makes sense. that's the kind of thing that i'm that i'm interested in because you know what you're showing is sort of spooky mm -hmm. uh, it's a little <laughs> bit eerie and i wondered whether either you or people who you work with or people who see this stuff for the first, first time find mm -hmm. any of this stuff surprising mm -hmm. Well, so so you, you, could, could you repeat the question again? Yeah. So, <laughs> are there? Do you have any experiences where you were surprised, or people that you showed this work were surprised by it, where it was unexpected or uncanny or spooky or eerie or weird? You know, did anybody react in that way, or is it all in the head? Uh, basically, everybody were surprised, <laughs> which we, we showed it. And so, yeah, they are, it's more like a, they, we, we have also kind of tried to explore the different things, such as kind of virtual objects, how to say, kind of collapse the glass or like a hit the keyboard and the type something. And then, yeah, that is more like a, how to say, one of the reasons is these are not aligned perfectly. So if the virtual object and physical object can be aligned perfectly, and then the, uh, it may have more some or somehow kind of realistic uh, sensation. But another one is, you know, it, they, they're surprised because it technically doesn't happen in, in the real world. But, um, you know, so that is somehow more like an illusion, right? So I'm not sure like, this is the, um, uh, how to say, it, with, with, which kind of factor affects this kind of surprisingness or kind of um, yes, surprisingness. But I, what, what we're trying to do here is more like a, the exploring the different interaction because nobody has ever done before. And we are also trying to explore what kind of interaction is possible and what kind of application would be meaningful, such as, say, for example, like a virtual person can also act, if the virtual person can also actually the physical environment, we can make some kind of remote collaboration more, more has it, engaging and immersive. Say, say, think about like if I can move the coffee cup on the Atlas room, and then yeah, that's, that's always kind of, kind of, you know, a, a little bit weird that it's also somehow if the perfect is synchronized we, we could also probably make the kind of remote collaboration under be more engaging right so that that's the kind of way we are thinking and a way we are trying to explore right now thank you jessica go um the one of my my the, the things that stuck with me is that you said you wanted to see humans live in computers i don't know if i understood that correctly mm -hmm. and what, what i'm wondering is if you are tracking as you do this re research how humans are affected um socially emotionally and psychologically when their focus becomes on a relationship with a computational artifact. So relationship between hum human and human or human and environment? I think all of it, human, human, human environment. <laughs> um, and if I'm understanding your bigger 
vision mm-hmm. goal, the environment will become the computer mm-hmm. and not nature or not, um, not, uh, not, not other humans. <clears throat> oh, so the, so this term is the basically inspired by like a science fiction, which is may, maybe you, you may have noticed, uh, you, you may have uh, read uh, the Neil Stevenson, The Diamond Age, where I think the, if I summarize it, you know, the, uh, the, the person can be in, uh, have say, uh, like a computer generated, uh, like, like environment or story. So the you know the uh, every everything you can actually program, which also like a visual and a physical, and what I mean by living in a computer is not a more like a how to say dystopiatic um, thing, but what we what I'm trying to uh, say here is what we can actually like a whole, whole every like a whole whole living environment, like a living world, you know, and, and, you know, and war or the object can be a dynamic medium. And I think what you are saying here is uh, in that kind of environment, what kind of relationship or interaction between the human and the human and the human and the computer is that, uh, am I understanding your question correctly? Yeah, because it will change, you know, when we, when we brought in computers and to the extent that they are in our lives today with, with phones and the number of hours people spend behind screens, it's mm-hmm. changed us to some level. And mm-hmm. so I think considering that as we continue to do work with augmented reality and, mm-hmm. and augmented intelligence and creating more of a relationship of human to computer, it's important to consider what happens to, to mm-hmm. human development and what happens to human to human interactions. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I think this is also somehow aligned to what I have been working at this kind of augmented conversation. But one of the goals here is the the be, you know the primary goal here is we are trying to uh, how to say prioritize the human to human conversation first. So the main goal here is don't the technology shouldn't distract uh, the natural conversation. But it's more like a, how to say the help, the augment, you know, the conversation. So I think the um, if we are kind of trying to augment the thing, maybe you know, as, as you can see, like a technology can start distracting the relationship between the humans. But I think it's more like a how we design the technology and how we design the user interface. And I really like the how Mark Weiser uh, envisioned in his seminar you know, article where you know, the technology should be disappear rather than, you know, the, uh, we uh, always kind of need to interact with the technology. So I think that we can apply the same principle when we design this kind of dynamic medium. So um, this kind of technology or this augmentation is not to be designed for just augmenting the information that our human, you know, natural human interaction should be considered as the the, the primary factor and how we can actually, how to say, like invisibly or how ha, ha, ha calmly uh, enhance this conversation or communication. That's, that's, that's I, I'm also kind of trying to uh, do the, um, to, to reduce, you know, thing. That, yeah, that's, that, does that answer your question? It, it does, and I guess I, I'm interested in the how you're doing that. Um, how you're, how it's improving the human experience and the human to human experience. If That's I understand your answer, your answer uh-huh. is like you want it to be in a, an artifact, kind of like, you know, dishes are an artifact during a meal and they're not mm-hmm. the focus of the meal, but mm-hmm. they, they allow for people to sit together and eat a meal. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so I'm just wondering how you're, you're doing that as a, yeah, that's that's a very good question. And uh, as a technical HCI researcher, I I always kind of start from the prototype something, and then the after kind of after developing, and we we can actually test through the user study. And we also have a lot of interesting insights 
from the user study uh, with these features that, that that's the kind of typical way I, I do. Maybe there might be uh, different approaches um, such as like a four, but yeah, I, I think I, I usually do that and then I, I probably need some collaboration for uh, to explore more kind of in-depth things yeah, for that. I think we have time for one more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have 10 more in my mind. We have two participants. Oh, Daniel is about Daniel. to say something. We have a hand raised, too. Oh, where? I can't see. That was cheap. Yeah. Uh, okay. Like like Mark, I have a lot of a lot of discussions <laughs> and questions. But uh, uh, I, I mean, so thank you. It's really interesting to see also where you've been going since your, since your graduation with your thoughts. Um, and one thing that I'd be really interested in uh, hearing your thoughts is this, you know, relationship between the technical development and the kind of world building or, or uh, you know, visionary element of like using them to tell a story. Uh, so do you think that some of the things that you're showing uh, are are going to be inevitable just because you know the technology keeps advancing like robot robots are gonna get smaller more advanced coordinates mm -hmm. so we mm -hmm. can just like we have a new hammer to to kind of apply to hci problems mm -hmm. or or did you have any in insights in your in your work where you really think that no these types of techno uh, you know, technical advances wouldn't work if we didn't if we didn't provide like strong motivating scenarios and also evidence mm -hmm. through your through your work <laughs> that we actually need to need to develop them further in this direction. I mean that's mm -hmm. a very open ended question, but maybe you have some thoughts on it. Right, I think that's very very important question, and that also always uh, makes me struggle because. You know, so especially for, for the physical one, we need that makes something like a platform level because anything doesn't exist. And then, yes, yeah, sometimes if we are just focusing on this kind of technical stuff, then yeah, we cannot, you know, we cannot show and achieve what we are truly want to, you know, achieve, right? So that, that is actually a very, um, how to say, like a spray off. And so if, if so, to, okay, so first of all, to answer your question about how the technology should evolve, that I think the first of all, we, we need to go, we need to get to the point where some, the people, like more and more people are interested in kind of developing the technology. Uh, by showing the potential. So that is an example, of, that is a somehow what the like AR VR is happening in this century. Like, you know, the, uh, like AR VR actually existed over like 50 years, but now when we show some interesting potential, I think maybe the Pokemon Go might be the, you know, one of the best examples for AR things, but then yeah, we can start democratizing and then the people are, a company that's kind of trying to invest more. So that's the kind of how the technology could evolve. But at the same time, um, so that's why I, I'm kind of trying to, you know, the balance between these two. So I'm not going to go into the very detail about the technical development. I, I, I want to, I, I don't want to be a kind of robotics example because I, I still, you know, I, my, my interest is always human interaction and how we can make than a physical thing. So that's why I'm kind of trying to, uh, you know, balance between that what we can actually do with the mixed reality because it gradually exists the, the available technology. But also the reconfigure of reality, I also want to highlight, we can also gradually have this kind of technology such as I have, uh, like I have, you know, the organized uh, with student innovation contest by, leveraging these kind of off-the-shelf Poyo robots. Obviously, this is still very large, I would say, 
that by using these robots, we can also, you know, create very interesting opportunity, right? So I, I, I myself doesn't need to be the first person to create this kind of, you know, cutting edge technology, but I am interested in how, how we can leverage these kind of technologies to show the potential. And if we need some new technology, we also need probably need to develop. But that's the kind of how my, I'm interested in. So I don't need to be a developer for the touch screen, but if someone can actually invent the iPad, then I can probably like a show the potential. But if someone doesn't really do that because there are too, too, too small people, or, you know, there are too few people working on it, then I also probably need to push the boundary for So that's uh, how, how, I use, how I do it right now. Um, <laughs> this is Chris. Um, is, I, I know everybody, <clears throat> we're ending, nearing the end. I don't want to um, go over the, the time, but I just, I did want to say I thought it was remarkable, and one of the things that um, just netted out to me as I was trying to process it all is, at the very least, um, you're accelerating the time to physical, if you will. That's kind of the way I think about it. And as somebody who started out at Silicon Graphics, and that was based on a technology called the Reality Engine, right? <laughs> and that, yep. They you know, literally created computer visualization. Um, and um, the goal there was for the computer to mimic reality and do that increasingly realistically. Uh, and, but, but the punchline is I couldn't also help but think about the fact that particularly given COVID and everything and all the stuff that's going on in biology, that they won the Nobel Prize for the double helix because they were able to take basically these building blocks and build uh, a Lego-like model of the molecule, right? And they discerned this molecule from the fuzzy pictures that Rosalind Franklin took with our uh, X-ray crystallography. Uh, so those tools were you know, primitive, if you will, versus the tools that we have today. But the punchline is the innovation that came out of their ability to physically manifest the ideas they thought they were perceiving uh, is remarkable. So in a sense, you're sort of unleashing this uh, capability at scale, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, that to me, I think is kind of profound. Uh, but anyway, I, I couldn't help but just mention that. I think anyway, it's kudos. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Right. Folks, folks, that's a most amazing, great conclusion. I could listen to this conversation all afternoon, <laughs> but you all can't. So thanks, Ryo. Thanks, Chris, for putting the nice bow around it at the end. And uh, very much appreciate. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.